Here we are, Farzi. We finally made it. May 39th. <laughs> well played, sir. May 39th at the time of this recording of OHL Stories. For those who have, are looking for this podcast on Apple Podcasts, we're working on it. You can find us on Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you found us today because you're listening. So we appreciate it. Tell your friends. Go to Spotify, YouTube. Um, you can find all of our episodes there. But May 39th is the Farwell for Hire campaign still going on? And will it be done by the time of puck drop preseason? <laughs> if if it was continuing for as long as I found people to complain to at Apple for reasons inexplicable our podcast is not there right now I, I think it was i think it's from the cory pecker episode if i'm honest with you i know we had a few more after that but you remember mm-hmm. when the cory pecker episode was posted on apple Podcasts, they didn't post his last name they put a little asterisk for the e because right. they thought we were doing some some funny business there it was it was the eerie otters fans we all knew that did the funny business when cory would score a goal but thanks a lot cory exactly uh to your question Let's blame him, right? Uh, it <laughs> he, was a, he was one of our best storytellers. Oh my gosh, get out so there. he was and excellent. Let's just let's just put this in here as a little bit of a tease here because that's part of our business. He did say that he would get Brad Boys and Sherry Basson, and the five of us would sit down for like a little round table. And you and I are talking like, you know what? That might not be a terrible way to kick off our next season. And I don't Carlo Koliakovo. Don't I forget. don't think he promised Koliakovo. Uh, Didn't he? Well, I, I was think, giving him gears because Car- Carlo breezed us. I know. But I think, I see, I think you're still hurt. Uh, but I don't maybe. think, I don't think Corey promised Koliakovo. Okay. I know it was boys for sure. Boise. Basson for sure. We'll find out. If we can get Carlo too, that's fine. Either way, Sweet. Pecker was such a good t- storyteller. Uh, put him on with a former teammate. We all are doing Basson. Like you and I are just going to sit back and say, hi guys. Yeah. And that'll be the Welcome. podcast, right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, to the question that started all of this. Uh, yes. As we record this, it's May the 39th, which is my way of describing the early part of June so that I stay in a happy and healthy relationship in my home because my farewell for hire campaign is supposed to be for the month of May, which has 31 days this year. It had 36. I I wrapped up with our final events on Sunday, June the 5th. And so we are just in the process of dotting I's, crossing T's, finishing the administration, because this is a a project of two people, myself and my significantly better half. So we want to make sure we got everything put together. We can announce the final total and see if we raised the $140,000 we were hoping to raise this year so we can take our total campaign time to more than a million dollars raised for cystic fibrosis research. So uh, Farwell underscore OHL on Twitter. Popey, by the way, is at underscore Chris Pope. But just watch uh, at Farwell underscore OHL on Twitter in the days ahead. And as soon as I have a final number, we'll post it on there. And you'll know that I wasn't messing around for the 36 days of May. Worked hard and made some money for CF. You never do mess around. You always hit your target. I'm just going to spoil it for anyone listening, but sorry. (laughs) Says you. Um, Well, also says my good friend and your good friend. I want to just give him a quick shout out. Tim Schott, Active Towing. Not a sponsor, but that's a free ad, Tim. You're welcome. But come on, but seriously, if if he doesn't deserve that little free plug, I don't know who does. Like, I, I kid you not, the last time I saw Tim in person, I, well, I guess not many of us have seen have seen any of us in, in person in years, but it has been years plural. And I got this random message out of the blue one day over Facebook. I actually thought I, I, I went to his profile to see if he'd been hacked because it was just like, hey Mike, how are you? I'm like, what's 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 Timmy doing? Give me like it was just Right. So I'm like, does, does this... he have hints on Bitcoin? <laughs> exactly. He's going to buy Bitcoin. <laughs> so first I go to make sure this is legit. And then I follow up and lo and behold, the conversation goes, so how far are you away from your goal? I should have told him a million dollars because he just, he tried to put in enough. I was just doing the numbers off the top of my head, but uh, the shot family. And, and when I went to pick up the check, I met his sister, Lori and his mom, Linda, for the first time in person. And they handed over a check for $15,000. Incredible stuff, and what makes me as happy as it does to get the money for our our charity, uh, the traction that that post got on our social media channels has been over the top, and they deserve every single bit of it. It was just an amazing gesture on their part. So thanks for bringing it up. He's one of the best, and you and I, as much as I like the pub Molson, you and I um, met him at Block Three. We got uh, the former founder of Block Three over here in the background, Brian, on the Friends of Killarney can. They do great work over there. I know. 
uh, Block Three is a big supporter of the campaign too. So I just want to give Tim a quick shout out because I love that guy. He's a beauty. I haven't seen him in a while either, but uh, good dude. And um, they own active towing. That's all. Anytime you're in need in the region of Waterloo, that's who you want to call. We'll just put it out there for you. And if you see someone in need, Mike, what do you? What should you do? You know, that's a really good point. What we want to do, and what our friends at Waterloo Region Crime Stoppers are interested in doing. That's why all of these volunteers work so hard with Waterloo Region Crime Stoppers. And there's a golf tournament coming up later this month, the annual Mo Norman. It's all in an effort to make the community a better place for all of us to kind of be in this together, not to overuse the overused phrase. But listen, if you see something going down that just doesn't seem to be the way it should be, let's use the resources we have available to us and reach out to 1-800-222-TIPS because you can make an anonymous tip to police to report a crime, to report something you saw. Again, I wanna stress that it's anonymous and you can earn up to $2,000 if that tip leads to an arrest. So help out our friends at Crime Stoppers, help out in your community by making that call to 1-800-222-TIPS. Or if you don't like using the phone, just go to waterloocrimestoppers.com. You can send in information that way. You can also learn more about the organization and as we said, help out in the community. Bunch of great people there doing some really good work on the volunteer side, for sure. Do you know who's going to be calling Waterloo Crime Stoppers, maybe? Uh, I'm thinking maybe Jay McKee, head coach of the Hamilton Bulldogs. Oh, we have worked Nailed together it. far too long, Mike. Nailed it is it. Jay McKee, our good friend. Cheese is going to be calling Waterloo Crime Stoppers because it is criminal what Wyatt Johnston is doing to that Hamilton Bulldogs hockey club. So we talked about the buzzsaw that the Bulldogs have been in these playoffs, 12 straight wins, sweeping their way through the first three rounds, a 47 and four record overall in calendar 2022. And then it's that whole rust versus rest discussion, right? When you come into the final, a well-rested Bulldogs team, a Windsor team that had to win on the road in game six, then come home to win game seven to knock off the Flint Firebirds. And it was the, team that was not rested Windsor winning the first game of that championship series so there went the dream of equaling the 14 and 0 mark of the Ottawa 67s from 2019 uh in fact now the best that the Hamilton Bulldogs can do is match the 16 and 2 of the London Knights in terms of overall playoff record but the real matter at hand now is they're down 2-1 in the series with game 4 on the night that this episode is released and, and you asked the on question, the road too. game yeah, four on exactly. the road in Windsor. Yep. But you asked the question last week when we were talking about this and, and the question was, how will the Bulldogs respond to adversity? We are absolutely going to find out in game four, because that is the pivotal game right now in this series, for sure. Ransom numbers. Listen, Thank all you. I know is they're going to be gross. Wyatt Johnston <laughs> is a beast. I, he's a just so good. He's got 37 points in 21 playoff games right now. That's pretty good. Not bad. Decent. Yeah. I, I honestly thought it would be a little higher, May, mostly just because of how badly he punished the Kitchener Rangers in five games. But, but I want to go to Hamilton. Okay. They face Peterborough in the first round, Mississauga in the second, and North Bay in the third. Would you believe that the Peterborough Peets scored the most goals in their series against Hamilton amongst those three teams? What? Peterborough, Peterborough scored nine goals against Hamilton in four games. Mississauga and North Bay only managed to score six goals in their series against North against Hamilton. That's, That's crazy. St- right. Six goals. Wyatt Johnston has six points in three games. How about that? How about how are you doing? I'm the best player in this league. Sorry, Luke Evangelista. Don't talk to me anymore. This kid is an absolute beast and yes the Windsor Spitfires are a deep offensive team this guy has six points in three games against a team that only allowed six goals in their previous two series he is a difference maker he will always be a difference maker in this league and it was a privilege to call five of his final games in this league (laughs) I was gonna say you you just said he's he will always be a difference maker in this league yeah for the next three or four games because Like that's, that's it. He will not be in this league beyond this season for sure. The Dallas stars have themselves a a real good one. And it's just what I love is watching it on this stage. Right. And I have no doubt in my mind that the Hamilton Bulldogs are far from out of this series. It's 
couldn't go long. The Bulldogs have too much talent and, and too much pride, frankly, to, to make it too easy on Wyatt Johnston and company. But watching these players do these sorts of things on this stage in the OHL final, it's, it's great for the league. I hope there are enough eyes on it because, frankly, the league does need to bring those eyes back with it next season. There, well, and you know what? There, let's just call a spade a spade. There probably isn't enough eyes on this series. Um, I wish there was because you look at the players in this series and there are uh, some big names to say the least. And I just wish that uh, I could say that every year. I wish this league got more recognition on a day to day basis every year, but especially this year. Um, but I do, and I do like that it's the top two seeds in each conference in the final. I said that last week or a couple weeks ago, whatever it was, I just wish people could watch it more. Like I want to watch the game. Okay. Game four tonight. I want to watch it. How? OHL, CHL TV. I got to pay to watch it. How's that helping your, your, I, I know what you're doing, but this is the OHL final. Make people pay for the regular season. They're watching two, you know, a thousand games. But it's the OHL final. Put it up there for free. Get some eyes on your league. People are still going to go to watch the game. They want to watch it in person. I, I I strongly believe that if you want to grow this game the way that you want to grow it, they need new fans. We've talked about this at length on this podcast. And now, especially after COVID, what better way? Hey, here's some free hockey. It's on a night where the NHL isn't on. We'll throw it up for free on CHL TV. You can watch all 68 games of your favorite team next year. Click here. It's Perfect. Uh, I, I think TSN's carrying the rest of the series. So still, though, that is one of those premium channels you do have to pay a little bit extra for. So uh, it, it's a fair point to raise in all they of this. They haven't played the first three games. I know that they're bouncing between the C or OHL, Q, and the dub, and then they're going to play the whole Memorial Cup, which is great. But I just, I think, put it up on, you're trying to build this app, throw it up there for free when TSN isn't carrying it. Anyway. I wish I could remember who I talked to, but is such a junior hockey fan now and and he's you know probably my age so you know middle age so that means the early part of his life obviously watching the national hockey league and whatever came in on the television there but uh, has has once he started into junior hockey he's now been into that for so long he doesn't even pay attention to the nhl anymore like he's so invested in the junior game which just goes back i thought of it when you made your point about you want eyes on this league eyes should be on this league i'm as passionate about the league as you are it's a great product but I, I do still carry that concern with me after the, I think that lost season really hurt. I don't want to dwell on this and be negative. We're in the OHL final, two great teams. It's been a lot of fun to watch so far. And I have no doubt it will be fun to watch the rest of the way for those who can watch it to your point. But I, I still, that lost season, I just can't stop dwelling on it and thinking about the impact it had on the overall product and, and people finding other things to do. You're probably right. I hope that, you know, as these restrictions continue to be lifted month after month and everything, you know, by September are the majority of people going to feel comfortable to go and sit with 7,000 in a building again. I don't know. Yeah, there, it's, it's been long, it's been long said that this league has an old crowd and if they don't do something to get the younger crowd in, in five years, all these new rinks are going to be half empty and all these people who are paying $5 million, $15 million for an OHL franchise. The ROI is not looking too hot unless this league tries to find a way to do better in getting younger fans into the building. You know, Popey, I think we've uh, worked together long enough for me to know something about you. And that something is you have been known to throw down the occasional wager from time to time on a sporting event. I have, and I never win, but I have. Well, you know what? It doesn't matter. Win or lose. Let me let me throw this out there as an option for you, Bobby. DraftKings. The London Draft... Knights? <laughs> no, not those DraftKings. Oh. The DraftKings Sportsbook is now available in Ontario. It's here, which means that you, because I know you like to do this from time to time, can legally bet on all of your favorite sports. And this is anything from MMA, which I know you love, to hockey, to playoff hoops, you take it. Everything is there at DraftKings Sportsbook. You can do it now from anywhere in the province of Ontario. 
And just to celebrate the pursuit for the cup that's going on right now, DraftKings Sportsbook is offering a wide variety of betting markets for every customer. You can check out DraftKings impressive features, including same game parlays. You select a game, combine multiple bets, like which team will win the goals scored and more for a shot to win big on a single game parlay. So, Hey, Ontario, let's get excited. DraftKings Sportsbook is live. Go to the app store and download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now, like not later, now. Get in on all the action only at DraftKings Sportsbook. I just downloaded it. I knew you did. I, there I could, it is. If, if you're watching on YouTube and you noticed how distracted Popey was, that's kind of like sometimes when he gets distracted during a hockey game, if you hear a pregnant pause. But if you're... If you're just listening right now, go check out the YouTube channel of OHL Stories and watch Popey. I knew exactly. As I was talking, he's like, he's totally downloading DraftKings Sportsbook right now. Well done, Popey. What? Good luck. Same game parlays. Did I mention that? Good luck. That's, that's why I downloaded it. Listen, I'm not going to lie to you, okay? I've had other betting apps. In fact, I've had four on my phone. I'm sorry, Mom. I've had four different betting apps on my phone. You can't do same game parlays, and I don't like that. Now, I'm going to. You know what I want to do? Go on tonight and make a bet on the OHL final <laughs> that I can't watch. All you need to know is DraftKings Sportsbook is giving you what you need on that app. Yes, sir. DraftKings, thank you very much for coming aboard. We appreciate you. DraftKings, download the app. Um, Farzi, our guest this week rode the bus with you. And I'm surprised we didn't get, I'm surprised I didn't ask him more bus stories of Farwell back in the day when Don was to your left. What was it like with Farzi on the bus? That's what I should have asked him. You know what's interesting that you bring that up because I was thinking about it a little bit and I, I felt really fortunate to get to know this guy the way that I did because he's, he's the, and you'll it, it comes across when you're going to hear him talk. He's, he's a really good guy. Like he's just a good human. Uh, but I, I remembered or I was thinking about it as we were hearing one of the stories about uh, Radic Faxa and the language barrier when he first got here. And I didn't say it and I, I won't even say it. Well, anyway, there, there was a, it, it's language that I don't think should be used, but it came, it was a quote from a movie. Okay. And so it was the movie that was watched Step Brothers. Over, so if you know the movie Step Brothers and you know the song that they make, it's boats and something. Yep. So that became, that became one of Radic Fax's go-to phrases and he picked it up from the movie, but to the point, that's what bus trips were like when Paul Fixter was still coaching the Rangers like a decade ago. And, and you and I have talked about this so many times. Like now, nobody says anything. There's barely a sound on the bus because everybody's got their face buried in a phone or their eye or their earbuds in or whatever. Like it used to be that shared experience of watching a movie. That said, it's not like Fixie was turning around to check out what I was doing because he was watching the same dumb movie 14 times that I was. And poor Don, you imagine him. <laughs> He would look at me, Pope. He's like, oh, this one again. Yep, Don, <laughs> this one again. Here's Will Ferrell and uh, what's his face? John C. Riley. Thank you. John C. Riley, who I love. Just very love. funny. Yeah. Um, imagine guy. how many, like, I never really thought of it that way. But if you factor in how many thousands of games Don did, how many millions of miles, he's all, I think I figured it out when he retired, I wrote his article. For 570 news at the time he's made it almost to the moon and back on a bus which is banana lands yeah but how many times do you think he saw a slap shot oh that's a great like question. honestly like yeah. it's been around for a while when it came out it was a like i just how many times do you think don cameron had to sit on that bus and listen to slap shot i bet you he could write the script by the time it was over craziness by the time I was working with Don, I will also say, though, he had mastered the art of sleeping on the bus. Hands would be folded across his stomach and his head would just go down. That's it. That's it. On occasion, it might be a little bit of a lean towards me in the other seat, but not often. It's just hands across the stomach, head straight down, out. The man knew it how only, to do it. It only takes 4,000 games to learn how to sleep on a bus. I got it. <laughs> I can, I can always know when you're about to fall asleep on the bus. Do you want to know what you do? What do I do? <laughs> phone goes down. I'm Put out. your phone down. Put your phone down. I'm like, well, he's out. <laughs> There's no crossword, no Sudoku. If his phone's going away, it's nighttime. 
Time to go. Yeah, and I just have the head forward. <laughs> the best down. time. The best time was when you put your head forward against the seat in front of you, and both of us share the same five head, and you had that red like it was a rug burn. Oh, on so your bad! Forehead. It was. It was a rug burn. Oh my gosh, it was hilarious. No joke. Before this podcast, I was sitting at the dinner table, and I, I'm like, oh, I got five minutes. I got to run downstairs, and I all of a sudden I realized I was wearing a black snapback. And I said to my roommate Kate, I, I kid my girlfriend Kate. Wow, wow. <laughs> well, I get chirped all the time about calling her a roommate like three months ago, so I had to throw it back out there. Um, I said, Oh no, I'm gonna have the like the little plastic part etched into my forehead for this podcast. I'm up there rubbing my head for five minutes. Come on, blood, get up here. <laughs> There's got to be a fix for that. We gotta make some somebody make a cream or something to help bald guys out. Gotta stop wearing my hat so tight. But, uh, uh, okay, anyway. Uh, our guest this week, former assistant coach with the Cornwall Royals. Bring back the Royals, baby. Before spending 16, 14, 16 years with the Colorado Avalanche of the National Hockey League as a video coach and a coach. We're talking Pat Roy. We're talking Peter Forsberg, Joe Sackick, Ray Bork. We're talking Adam Foote, Adam Denmarsh, Merrick um, uh, Hey Duke, Milan Hey Duke, Paul Fixter sat in the video room with all those guys showing them what the coaching staff wanted to do wrong. And then after winning two Stanley Cups in 96 and 01, he came back to his home of Kitchener, where he grew up playing minor hockey, eventually going on to play with the Cambridge Junior B team, came back to Kitchener as a coach with the Kitchener Rangers under Steve Spott, went up to Sudbury for a couple of years, add in a couple stops in Hershey and Rochester in the American League, and a quick two years in the CHL Paul Fixter has been around the game of hockey a long time, and he joined us on OHL Stories for Waterloo Crime Stoppers and DraftKings. I think the place that we have to start this, even though there is a lot to talk about, including those Stanley Cups, plural, uh, with a guy like Paul Fixter, is getting the chance to be behind the bench of the Kitchener Rangers in the Ontario Hockey League, because Fixie, you're, you're a Kitchener boy, and that you know, Stanley cups, notwithstanding that, that must've felt like you had really reached some sort of pinnacle in your coaching career. Thanks for having me guys. I I'm, I'm excited to uh, talk again because I don't get the opportunity because nobody, nobody reaches out anymore. Right. Like you're, you're forgotten about Mike coming as a Kitchener boy coming back here uh, was something I wanted to do. And uh, during the uh, 2008 uh, Memorial Cup, uh, Pete, we knew Pete was moving on. I, I knew Pete was moving on. And, uh, you know, Spotter and I had been in talks. And to come back home to coach in, in, in my hometown was a dream. Fit, to have family and friends and, you know, my parents who had been away from for so many years uh, in the stands. My dad taught me the game of hockey. So it was a real dream uh, treat to come back. And, and I cherish those nights that I had standing on the bench, uh, looking up and seeing Aunt Joanne over here and Uncle Doug over there and, and my mom and dad over here and my wife up behind me. And so it, it, was, it, was, it was awesome. Uh, played in the auditorium as a kid, tried to hit the queen with a wrist shot, you know, up over the, the glass. And, uh, uh, God, uh, I, you know, 26 years in the game, you have a lot of memories. Those, those years in Kitchener are right up there with, with the best. I'm curious if there was any negative to coming back to Kitchener and coaching, obviously your team did well, but I'm thinking moving down the street from your parents, what, five or six doors down in forest Heights, everyone knocking on your door, Paul, I don't like the offense last night. Was there ever any of that when you were back in Kitchener? <laughs> Well, I, I, I'll get to that, <laughs> but I, I will, I, I'll, I'll lead into that by like, I coached in Hershey, Pennsylvania, very small, like the size of, let's say, uh, St. Jake, uh, Elmira ish, but somewhere between, you know, St. Jacobs and Elmira. And I'd be in the coffee shop on my way to the rink in the mornings. And, and they, and I coach, uh, hi, yeah, big, big uh, fan, uh, you know, every, every game. What's wrong with the power play? <laughs> so, you know, I dealt with that stuff well before getting here. And then, then you get here and you know everybody, you know, mom and dad have so-and-so over and Paul, like the, you know, the penalty kill. I don't work on the penalty kill. That's uh, Troy Smith. <laughs> so 
uh, yeah, I dealt with it, but that's just people being passionate about it, right? And, and caring and, and that's, yeah. hey, listen, I was, a, long before I was a coach, I was a fan too. And, and now that I'm not coaching anymore, I'm a fan and I'm, I'm critiquing like what happened here, what happened there. So I, I get it. And I love that passion. So I was prepared for that. I was prepared for that, you know, long before I got here, obviously. And um, you, know, you just deal with it and it's, it's water off a duck's back. That, uh, that path into coaching Fixie took you to one of my favorite markets, former markets. Hope knows where this is going to go automatically because every time anybody's got any connection to the Cornwall freaking Royals, I'm like, let's go bring back the Royals, get them back in this league. But what was the experience like up there? Mike, you know, you are so right that Cornwall should be in the league. It's a great community. Um, it's a passionate. I still have a lot of friends there. It's a passionate hockey community. Great history. Three Memorial Cups. You know, you look at the likes of Howard Chuck, Gilmore. Uh, <laughs> the list goes on and on and people have come through there. In fact, Bobby Orr's junior defense partner, uh, Bob Kilgore from Oshawa, member of parliament. I mean, it, it's just Doug Carpenter. The history is phenomenal. I loved it. And so I, I don't want to make this too long, but so in 19, uh, 1990, I was uh, finishing, um, uh, finishing my graduate program, University of Windsor. And in the 80s, I had worked at a hockey school called Huron Hockey School with Mark Crawford. Mark, Mark's uh, uh, career, playing career was coming to an end. He had taken the head coaching job, uh, GM and head coach of the Cornwall Royals. He calls me and he says, you know, I, my, I'm done playing. I'm retiring. Uh, I know you're finished school. We had kept in touch over the years. He says, uh, <laughs> I, I need an assistant. And I had applied to, uh, I, was, I was going to do my PhD and I had written my LSATs. I was going, you know, I, I love school because you didn't have to be in the real world. <laughs> I, just, I, I, was, I was a decent student and, uh, you know, I was playing hockey. I was, my, played my fifth year. I was going to be a coach with the team. And he says, I really like to hire you as, as an assistant coach, assistant GM. So I said, what the heck, let's, let's put my, uh, you know, dip my toes in the water. And best, best decision I ever made in, in, in hockey. So Mark and I were two newbies, um, you know, learning the coaching game, learning to deal with player, young players. And honest to God, it was great. I remember the scouting trips. We, his father, Floyd, was the uh, director of hockey operations. And, you know, he was the boss. <laughs> and we'd have to, after a scouting venture, we'd have to go find the closest payphone to... <laughs> report back to Floyd, you know, and hey, do you have a quarter? I don't have a quarter, you know, <laughs> all those sorts of things. So Mark, Mark gave me my chance, my opportunity, and we worked well together. And, and then, you know, fast forward, he got the, the, the job, he went on to St. John's and, and uh, uh, then Quebec, and then he got the job in Denver and he called me and we had a lunch meeting and he, that year, that was uh, 2000, uh, 90, 94, 1994, sorry. Um, that was a lockout year. And it was a 48 game season, if you recall. And the Quebec Nordiques were the number one seed. And back then one played eight, two played seven, you know, three played six, four played five. They played the New York Rangers and lost in the first round to the New York Rangers. And um, yeah, he was under a lot of heat and, and teams were starting to do video. And so we had this lunch meeting and he was, he wanted me to come to Denver to be a, a video coach. And I said, well, what does that mean? He says, I'm not really sure. Other teams are doing it. We didn't, we just lost to the eighth place team. You know, we were the number one seat. We need a video coach. And we figured out the job and what it meant and VHS and all that stuff. But uh, that's, that's, that's kind of Mark and my, uh, you know, our history and he gave me a great opportunity. And when I saw what a, what a great coach Mark is and still is, I thought, boy, this is a guy that I want to be around. And I learned a ton from him. And, you know, ultimately we won the cups together. And uh, so it was fantastic. But opportunity came in Cornwall, Mike. And uh, the history's there. 
the people love it and there should be an OHL team there. Shout out Steve Malaski, who was on this podcast as well, former Cornwall Royal with Mark Crawford. I played against, um, I played against him. He was at RMC when I was in yeah. Windsor. Oh yeah. That, that would make sense. Yeah. Um, you mentioned you were in Windsor. I got to ask, what's the best pizza spot in Windsor when you were there, Fixie? Oh boy. We talk a lot about Windsor pizza on this podcast. We do. It's, it's an obsession <laughs> yeah. here. Yeah. I, yeah. Boy, that's, I, I'm going to go. One thing that I'm, I, I miss the tunnel barbecue ribs so i that's my uh that well they're gone it's 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 gone they were there forever but pizza i don't know you've got me there (laughs) pope okay then we'll move past it i I was a student like if i could find five five cent chicken wings yeah uh, anything right you're a university student so i will go back to cornwall then because i want to ask in your opinion why isn't there why hasn't the ohl went back to Cornwall, uh, I I don't know. Um, yeah. You know our, our our crowds were good. I, I let's going back a lot of years for me. Uh, the owner at the time um, just saw bigger things outside. They went from Newmarket to Sarnia. They're now the Sarnia Sting. Cornwall yeah. Rose are the Sar- Sarnia Sting, um, and Newmarket didn't work out, obviously. Um, I, I, it's a, it's a great question. I, I don't have the answer. I do know, I, I still have some of my best friends live in Cornwall and they, they ask, they ask the same question to me. And, um, <laughs> I wish I had the answer. I, I don't, uh, I, I just, it, it's such a great, it, it's such a great community and, and, and passionate and, and you know they, they they had the moat around the building. You remember, Mike, like the like the moat around, but absolutely, you, know, you, you could put seats there, like fill the moat in. <laughs> like, <laughs> like it's not it's not that hard. We had the Cornwall. I worked with Jacques Martin when uh, when the Cornwall Aces came in, which was the Quebec Quebec Nordiques American League team, and I was working for Huron Hockey School, and I I would skate the. Uh, the extras, let's say, and like the team would go on the road and they'd leave players behind. And my job was to skate the extras and I did some video work with him, whatever. And, you know, the crowds were great in the American League too. And players loved coming there. And, and uh, so I, I, don't, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a great question. I don't know the answer, um, but they should have a team. Like they really should. And, you know, you got Kingston, Ottawa, Bell, well, Belleville's out of the league now, but like Peterborough, it, it's just, it's just kind of a natural sort of swing. Yeah. I still think the same way about it now, now that you, when you mentioned Martin and then of course, Mark Crawford gets me thinking of, uh, of coaches you worked with Mike Felino, you, you and he not only were together in Hershey, but then had, you know, both to Sudbury at a different time. But anyway, what was it like with Felino as a co-coach? Mike, Mike was awesome. Uh, uh, you know, and I look, I, you know, I, now I watch the game. Uh, I watch people ask me who, who, you know, who, who's your team. And I said, I don't have a team. I watch players that I coached play, pe- players that I know, including Marcus and Nick. When I was at Hershey, Marcus and Nick were two little boys running around the, the dressing room. Like I went to, I went, you know, it's 20, uh, 21 years ago that I went to, to Hershey. So like they were just little boys around the rink all the time so uh my my story about mike and i love mike felino and he just you you the the hard-nosed passion that you saw on the ice that's the way he he coached but the most soft loving like family man just a just an unbelievable person and i'm before i answer your question i'm just going to give a little bit of a shout out to his wife uh, the late Janice uh, Felino and her her maiden name was Jockman, and when I when I heard that her her maiden name was Jockman, I said, like Ed Jockman, who I loved, and she's well, that yeah, that's my uncle. And I'm oh my god, like the lineage is just crazy, right? And she was such Janice was my wife Leslie and I weren't married at the time I was in Hershey, and and Leslie was. Uh, Janice was such a great uh, mentor, whatever the word is, for Leslie, who was really, you know, was new to the hockey world. 
uh, Janice just said, well, there's going to be nights like this and nights like that. And, you know, you're, you're going to have, have to deal with them. My story with Mike is, uh, so I, I, my, I was Mike's assistant in Hershey and he went on to the Sudbury Wolves. And so I took his, his chair in Hershey as the head coach. And then Mike, uh, Mike uh, left Hershey and I took his, is a chair in the, in the coach's office in Sudbury as a head coach. And so I catch up with Mike later, later times. And I said, Mike, you know, I, I followed you in Hershey as a head coach, uh, sat in your chair, followed you in Sudbury, you know, as a head coach, sat in your chair. And he says, yeah, I just hope the next chair we sit in isn't the electric chair. <laughs> I have to laugh at that because like, that's Mike, that's Mike to a T. He just, you know, he, he was awesome. And I learned a hell of a lot from him. Like he, his, 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 his preparation was fantastic and his practices were great. And his, his love and uh, uh, concern for each and every player from, from, you know, bottom to top, it was there. And, and I think that's why you see, you know, his boys have done so well. Like they've learned from a great, great father, a great mentor. Funny you mentioned Janice. I wrote a unit or an article in university when I was working for the Brock Press, jumping for Janice after interviewing Marcus because uh, his brother had just been drafted and Janice was there. But then when Marcus was drafted, Janice was too sick to actually be at the draft. And you could hear from Marcus just the um, importance of what Janice meant to that family because you hear a lot about the obviously the players, but behind the scenes, there's always someone pulling the strings like Janice. She she was she was phenomenal. Um, just just a tremendous. Tremendous lady, great mother, uh, uh, just fantastic. You, you're so right. Like, and and for Leslie, like there there was a night, and I, I we were in Hershey, and Hershey, the Hershey Arena was you know ten thousand. It was the new building, the the Giant Center, and you know there's ten thousand people in there, and we in Hershey, we Mike and I uh, had the longest team had been around 75, 80 years. We had the longest losing streak in the history of the team, uh, 12, 12 or 13 games. And there were, you know, and Nick and Marcus and, and uh, the, the two daughters, Kara and Lisa were little kids. And my, my girlfriend at the time, Leslie, was sitting there and, you know, 10,000 people, ho, 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 Felino must go and all this stupidness. Right. And, and that's where Janice was really good to Leslie, like saying, you know, there's going to be nights like this. So we fought, we made two trades. We traded for uh, Brett Clark. I don't know if you remember that name. And uh, who's working with the Avalanche now as a player development and DJ Smith, who coaches Ottawa Senators. We traded for those two players. So we followed the longest losing streak in the history of the team with the longest winning streak in the history of the team, back to back. Like, I don't know if anybody has ever done that with any organization. And, you know, those two trades were up tremendous for for our team we we obviously needed defensemen and, and we went out and got two quality defensemen who really helped our team but uh there were tough times during that 13 14 game losing streak uh it, it was awful and uh you know leslie said like why are we doing this and i said i love it well people are booing you and like oh well you know what that's just part of it like <laughs> so now when i'm when i'm playing golf and stuff and and uh, people are talking to my backswing and, uh, and they apologize. I say, hey, listen, I've had 10,000 people booing me. A little bit of chatter in my backswing doesn't bother me. Don't worry. You, you mentioned DJ. You also had Sheldon Keefe on that team. Was he more Sheldon uh, like he was as a player in junior? Or had he turned the corner and maybe maturing a little bit like the Sheldon we're seeing now? <laughs> he was Sheldon the junior. <laughs> and and he, he was awesome, though. I... I, I I loved, I loved him because he reminded me a lot. I, I had been around Theo Fleury. We, we acquired Theo Fleury in uh, Colorado in 1999 uh, from, from Calgary. And uh, Sheldon reminded me a lot of Theo, just his kind of nonchalant, uh, very laissez-faire, easygoing, you know, nothing really matters. I, like I can visualize right now, Sheldon sitting in, in uh, uh, Dan Stock Beaker, our, our trainer's uh, athletic training room, and just on the table. Hey, Sheldon, how are you doing? What's going on? Ah, no, good coach. You know, 
nothing, uh, everything's good. He was, he was a great teammate. Uh, he worked hard. He, he was with Tampa. It, it, that was an interesting situation to be in. We had uh, Tampa players. We had Colorado players, obviously. I was with Colorado. We had Tampa players and we had Florida uh, Panther players. So there were three organizations sending players into, into the American League there, which isn't an easy situation to be in. Like, you're, you know, you, you, you want to play your, Amer your, uh, your affiliate players, but if your players from the other organizations are better, you want to win. So, you know, and Sheldon was a good player for us. He really was. You know, I, that kind of leads me into thinking um, I had I, three players that I coached in, in Hershey that have gone on to be head coaches and Sheldon's done a, a great job with Toronto and, and, and DJ's, you know, doing his thing in Ottawa and, and then Brad Larson in, um, in uh, Columbus. And I try to think like, well, maybe I wasn't such a good coach in teaching the game. Maybe I was a better coach in teaching the way to coach. I don't know. But that's kind of, you, you look back now as an, as an older guy on 59, um, you hope you had some sort of impact on everybody that has led them to better things. I sent, uh, I sent some texts out to Colorado, obviously with them getting back to the cup after 20, 21 years. And, you know, it made its way to Gabriel Landeskog. Um, and, you know, he, he sent a nice note. And, and uh, so I, that's, that's really what I take away from all my years, how, you know, the players have moved at some point, there won't be players that I know anymore. And, you know, then I guess I won't care as much, but right now that's my real passion is watching the Jeff Skinners and, and even guys like I still look up Ryan Murphy and, and, you know, Ben Thompson or whatever, Jason Akins, like guys that are still kind of playing in different leagues. You follow them because you, you know, because you had some sort of impact in their life. Since you just mentioned the name uh, let's go back to Jeff Skinner as a kitchen arranger, because you're new to the team as a coach, but you get that success really early on. I think it was your second season, right? And you go to the Western Conference final, and it, it, it let's be honest, Fix, it was the Jeff Skinner show for the Kitchener Rangers. I know it was the Taylor Hall show the other side, and we know how it all turned out for Kitchener, but Jeff Skinner was a man possessed that entire season, and that playoff remains one of the best playoffs I've seen, bias notwithstanding. He, he, uh, you know, Mike, and I, I tell this all the time. I, I spoke at Victus Academy recently and, you know, it's, it's, it's obviously a, a where kids go to school first and foremost and, and get their hockey as well. And I always say, you know, our best players were our best students as well. And Jeff was, he was an A plus student and an A plus player. He put everything into his passion was, was, and his, his commitment was off the charts. Um, I, I, and that kid, that kid, he's not a kid anymore, but he, back then he was a kid. I keep calling him kids. That, that makes me feel younger. Hey, the, he, he's still a kid of the three of us. Exactly. <laughs> but, you know, he just, he was the first on the ice and, and last off the ice and just smile on his face and his compete level. And, you know, even in practice, he, he, he tried to score. Like that year, like, like he had 50 goals that year. He tried to score every time we did whatever drill we were doing, a one-on-one -on -one or a, whatever drill, we, he tried to score and rather than just throwing the puck on the net. You know, like a lot of, a lot of players just, hey, okay, I have to, I have to shoot on the, at the end of the drill. I have to shoot. So now I shoot and just put it on the four by six net. Well, no, Jeff tried to score every time. And, you know, I, I have down in my, my gym in my house here, I, I have the portrait of him scoring the 50th goal. And I believe it's against um, Bennington. Yep. It's own sound. Yeah. And it, I knew it was own sound. I think it's Bennington and Nat. Yeah. And uh, I have that signed by him down in my gym. And I look at that uh, every day that I'm down in my gym. And I just think, like, there's a guy that deserved to score 50 goals. Like, because he worked at it and, and wanted it. And, you know, it's too bad. We, we, we lost him. Good for him that he went on to Carolina as, uh, I guess, an 18-year-old, right? 18 turning 19. Because we really built our team around him and then he's gone, you know. Um, so, same thing happened. Going back to Cornwall, same thing happened. We, we had some great players, John Slaney, Owen Nolan. And Mark and I had built our team around, you know, John Slaney and Owen Nolan. Owen Nolan made the Quebec Nordiques as an 18-year-old. 
Well, you take the best player off your team, the best player in the league off your team. Well, you're not, you know, your, your, uh, your plans have been uh, changed a little bit and, and our plans were changed and, you know, good for Jeff. He deserved to, to, to move on. And, and that's what, it, you know, the bottom line is the Ontario, Ontario Ugly is a developmental league. And if players are good enough to move on, good for them. They should move on. You mentioned 50 in the regular season and then 20 and 20 <laughs> playoff games too. Crazy. <laughs> Not Crazy. Bad. I'm curious though, Fixie, when, Sometimes when these kids are drafted out of minor hockey, there's not a lot of um, knowledge when it comes to coaching staffs about these kids because they haven't been on many scouting trips and stuff. So I'm curious, was there anyone upon seeing Jeff Skinner show up to training camp and 5'2", looking 12 years old, where, where they like, what is going on over here? And then you see them on the ice and you go, this is what's going on. Yeah, well, so Pete, Pete DeBoer and Steve Spot were the ones who like, and the, and the staff, for the ones who drive, that was the year before I came. So I never saw Jeff play as a, as a, uh, as a, as a midget, minor midget. I don't, can you say that anymore? I know it's you, it's you, you 16, I believe, right? You I, something. You something. <laughs> so um, anyways, as a, I never saw him play in his minor midget year, um, but they saw like the scouting staff obviously saw something and there, there's a real pedigree in that whole uh, Skinner family. Like, it's sisters that played at Harvard and, and, you know, his, his brother Ben was a decent player too. And so there was a lot of uh, good athleticism in that family. Um, I never saw him at training camp, like his, his rookie year. Well, I did, but I never saw him up to, up to that point. Uh, he came in, he was a tremendous skater because of his figure skating background so you could see that he, he could skate and that, you know, that today is, that's today's game. Even back when Jeff was a junior, it was all about skating. Um, and just his, his, uh, his, like his, I, I'm going to use the word like feistiness, his, his compete level. He, he, you know, he had the peach, peach fuzz face and, you know, soft, soft body, but he just found a way to be better than everybody else. Um, and, it's not hard to identify those, those kids, like those, those kids that stand out for, for whatever reason, you know, their, their physical play or their, their skating ability or whatever, they, they stand out for a reason. And Jeff was one of those players that stood out for a reason and showed it and then showed it in his draft year and, you know, has, has shown it, you know, he's, 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 um, and he's been a fun pro to watch because he's had ups and downs and injuries and, but, he finds a way to, you know, I mean, this year he had a heck of a year again this year after having a not, not so good last, uh, the season before. So, um, yeah, yeah like he, to, to answer your question, you, there, there's something about those kids that stand out and there's a reason they stand out and, and Jeff showed it. Looking back, would, would that year fix have been, uh, the, the high water mark in, in retrospect, uh, two years later, you're back in that conference final. But when you, when you look back on, on coaching, uh, specifically in, in Kitchener, uh, where, what, what stands out as the, the best memory? Wow. Um, there's so many, Mike. Yeah. Like there, there really are. Uh, like, like I'm really, and I guess it's a bad memory, but like being up, three three nothing against Windsor and then Taylor Hall just I mean, taking control of the uh the series uh just I guess just the high of being up three nothing thinking we're, we're winning this like we're going to win this and and then now we they, uh, there, there's so many Mike there are so many great memories uh, I, I, I th that, that's a, that's a bad one because we lost, uh, <laughs> but beating London out, you know, that, and, and waving, waving to my family, waving to my friends, um, uh, you know, watching, and I just, I was just texting with them today over something else, watching the, the progress of Ben Finelli. I was on the bench as Ben was a 16 year old and, and had the terrible hit uh you know and then to watch his comeback and watch him behind the scenes that people didn't see what he did to 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 get to the point where he was able to play be the captain of the team uh 
that to me is a great memory, Mike. Um, and watch this kid like persevere and want to be on the ice with us and wasn't allowed to. And, and I'd go out and skate with him a little bit, you know, just kind of pass the puck around with him and do things one-on-one. -on -one. And so I, like my memories of Kitchener are just tremendous. Uh, just the opportunity to stand in that arena on the bench as a coach is tremendous <laughs> to stand on the bench on the visiting side with the Sudbury Wolves with an inferior inferior team and win a game. And I, I, I believe, I, I think it was overtime that we, we beat Kitchener that uh, the one time uh, that was pretty special. That was uh, that was fun. And I had people heckling behind me and uh, I, I, Honest to God, like I, I just loved being in the auditorium and I, I skate, uh, I haven't in the last two years here with, with COVID, but I skate on uh, Wednesday nights with, with a group of guys and they, they, oh, this is awesome. They're looking around the auditorium and think, guys, you have no idea how awesome it is when there's 7,000 people in there. If you ever write a memoir, heckled in my hometown, I'm going to throw out there as a Ooh. title for you. <laughs> I like that a lot. Yeah. That's a good title, Farzi. Um, I, I know it's tough to talk about Fixie, but that Finelli hit. What was what was going through your mind moments after that hit happens? Why did I put a 16-year-old on the ice with a 20-year-old on the ice? Went through my mind and still to this day does. You know, I was in charge of the defense. I put the defense out on the ice. I put Ben Finelli on the ice that night. And Mike Liambus was on the ice. And, uh, you, you know, you, you, you try to do your matchups or whatever, but Ben was such a good player. I thought Ben could play with anybody on the ice. But you put a 16-year-old and you put a 20-year-old, you know, there's, there's an age difference. There's a physical difference. There's, and, you know, uh, I, I felt a lot of responsibility for putting Ben in a situation that he shouldn't have been put in. I don't know if that's right or wrong. Uh, I, I did. Uh, that's what went through my mind. And, and still to this day, uh, Ben and I keep in touch, as I said, but um, it bothers me that, uh, you know, I might have had some, uh, some responsibility in that, in that play. Listen, I, uh, it's not, it's probably not fair to me to, to beat myself up like that, but I, but I do. And um, I felt, I felt terrible. I, 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 I did. Um, uh it never should have happened. Like it was a terrible, it was a terrible, I, I can still, I can still see it happening right, right now. And uh, it, it was awful. It was an awful experience. And uh, I'm just glad in the end that, uh, you know, Ben's doing well and um, life goes on and, and everything's good. But uh, that was a tough night. Popper, that was a tough, tough night. And we went down, Spotter, myself and Troy went down to Hamilton and, um, you know, it wasn't easy, to say the least. There's no doubt that you're passionate about the game. Nobody is in it for 26 years without having that fire in the belly. Uh, you know, the highs and the lows. You talked earlier about Mike Felino's wife, Janet, and what a role model she was to your wife, Leslie. Getting to know you over the years, I've, I've gotten to know certainly how competitive you are. Is it for you, Fix, the... The, the, the pain of losing, is that greater than the joy of winning? I love winning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I love winning. I love competing. I, I, I won, uh, I played golf today and I won my match today, Mike. So like I, every, everything I do, I, I, I try to win. You know, I, I, I do. And I, I was around the greatest competitor that I've ever been around in my life. Patrick Waugh. I played golf with Patrick. I was on the ice with Patrick. We, we won a couple of cups together. This guy competed at, you play cards on the plane. This guy competed at every, he, he wanted to win. And that's me. Like I, I want to win. Um, I hate, I hate losing. <laughs> I mean, losing, but, but I'm realistic. In the end, there's only one team that wins. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I hate losing more than I like winning though, to, to kind of answer your question. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, I catch, I catch it from my wife a lot. Like we're, we're doing, 
you know, whatever, playing cards or playing a board game or something. And she's like, God, do you, do you always have to win? And well, that's my nature. Like I just, I, 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 like we had a little match today at the golf course and, you know, my partner and I won and it was a, it was for, it was for a beer after the match. But when there's something on the line, you want to win. And I've been around greatness. I, and I, I guess that's where you get it. And I, when I say greatness, I like, I'm talking about, and I hate name dropping because uh, that's not me. I'm not a name dropper, but I, I've been around Patrick Waugh and, and Joe Sackick and Peter Forsberg and Ray Bork. And I played golf with Bobby Orr. My best friend is, is best friends with Bobby Orr. And I played golf with Bobby. I played a couple of times. And I'll tell you what, this guy, I understand greatness. This guy plays the game of golf to win. And it was for $5. And, and he, he played for the $5 to win. And, and I like that. I mean, you want to be around people that are passionate about being, being the best in whatever they do. And it's not, it's not easy to do. In the end, there's only one that is the best. But if you're trying to be the best, at least you give yourself a chance. And that's what I was always about. Like, let's give ourselves a chance. And if we lose, we lose. But at least we tried. At least we tried doing the best we can to, to, be, to be the winners, you know. And there's circumstances. I... You know, I look, we, we've, we've talked about this years, years and years and years with, with the guys I've been around with the Avalanche, you know, and we were, we were lucky and fortunate enough to win two cups. There's three things that go into, you have to have a good team. You have to good players, obviously. You have to be healthier than your opposition, you know, and that doesn't mean you're healthy, but you're healthier than the opposition. And yet you have to have a bit of luck. You know, somebody gets knocked out. Like when we won the cup in 96, they're, the Islanders were good and, and the Penguins were good too. And they both had lost out. We ended up playing Florida, uh, who was just around 500 in the regular season. And they beat out a couple of good teams. So we got lucky there. Um, so there's a lot that goes into it that, um, you know, is just, it's, it's not easy. It's, it's not easy, but when you get there, it's, it's, it's fun. <laughs> I, I don't get starstruck too often, Fixie, but I'm, I want to know what it's like when you meet Bobby Orr for the first time. Like, that's Bobby freaking Orr. <laughs> first time I met him was it, it was in the Kitchener Auditorium. My, my good friend, Dr. Bern Stenlin, who's written a lot of books, and he, he was a coach of mine at the University of Windsor and uh, uh, was, was uh, played four, four games in the National League. You know, he's, he's kind of a mentor to me, and he's become my best friend. He was doing a program with GM Motors. It was called GM Safe and Fun for, for kids. Uh, kind of like a, not a hockey camp, but a, uh, like a, like a learning, learning the game sort of camp. And they were doing it at the auditorium. And he said, uh, want to come down and uh, introduce you to Bobby. And so I brought some of my family and my, my nephew and niece. And so that was the first time I met him. And I was like awestruck. He's my all time, other than my father, He's my all-time hero, you know, in the game of hockey, he's, he's the best. And I was just like, my God, I'm, I'm, I'm meeting God. Like he was God to me. And so then Byrne says to me, well, uh, you know, Bobby really liked you. He wants to invite you down to his place. So he went to his place in Cape Cod and played, played some golf. And <laughs> so, so the, the, the first day, so Byrne and I are our partners and then Bobby and his, his buddy are partners and there's we're playing three days three days of golf and we lose twenty dollars the first day and Vern, we're driving the cart back bobby bobby lives on the course he's part of one of the course and 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 uh Vern's all upset and i said well Vern, if if we lose if we lose tomorrow you know it's 40 bucks the third day is just a friendly it doesn't matter like so 40 bucks i said who cares he says, well, it's $40 US. I said, it doesn't matter, Vern, it's $40. I said, people would pay thousands of dollars to do what we're doing. And he says, no, you don't realize how much they would pay me more than that, Paul. In the end, we won the next day and all, it was all even. And the third day was just a friendly, so it didn't matter. He, he's the greatest guy. He's competitive. He's awesome. My eyes were, were, were awestruck until you, you get to talk to him. He's just another person. You know, I stayed at his, at his house. He made me coffee and a bagel in the morning. I'm thinking he's no different than any of us. He gets up, makes coffee, you know, hey, what can I get you a bagel? And 
He's just the most wonderful person in the world. And to meet, for me to be lucky enough to beat my hockey, to meet my hockey hero was really special. And to this day, uh, I, I cherish that. And in fact, I'm leaving in two weeks to go down and play again with, uh, with him and a few other guys. So I, I'm looking forward to that. It's been in the plans for a couple of years and COVID's put a, put a bit of a glitch to that, but we're, we're heading out in the two weeks to go down and play some golf. I'd have kept a piece of the bagel. Just frame it. <laughs> I'm just thinking it's a good thing we got this guy when we did. He's going off to golf with Bobby Orr. Bobby he makes Orr. time for a couple of schmucks like us, you know. <laughs> well, I, Farzi, I always have time for you. I know you. You're a good man, Fix. Along those lines, from somebody that is known, and you've already mentioned him as one of the fiercest competitors the game has ever known, that being Patrick Waugh, but also kind of learning that there's a side to Patrick Waugh that is very human. You once told me a story about a, a kid in a hospital that Patrick phoned after a game, even though the game did not go the way Patrick would have wanted the game to go. So that's my, my cousin's son. He was battling. And I talk about my aunt Joanne who uh, season ticket holder with the, uh, with the Rangers for forever, her, her grandson. Uh, so my, my cousin, Larry, his son was going through a real bad bout with leukemia to the point where they had, um, they picked out his gravesite. And uh, his, his, his hero, his, his favorite player was Patrick Waugh. And I, I said, Patrick, maybe you could just give this kid a call and, and lift his spirits. My, my aunt had asked me that. And he said, no, no problem, Paul. I'll, I'll call the kid after the game. So we were out in San Jose and we lost. 5-1, 7-1. So we, we got shellacked, 7-1. And I was always one of the last to get to the bus because I had to clean up my video equipment, you know, and, and, and Patrick was one of the last to the bus that night because he was not happy about the performance. And we're walking through the hallway to, together and he said, oh, I, I forgot. You asked me to, to call your, your, he said, my cousin. I, I, I said, yeah. yeah. He said, I said, Patrick, don't worry. He said, no, no, give, give, me, give me the phone. Give me the so he calls the kid and he must have talked to him for 15, 20 minutes, uh, held the bus up, never got on the bus, stayed, stayed outside, held the bus up. You're going to hold the bus up for Patrick Waugh. And, and uh, coincidence, ironic, I don't know. That kid's, uh, I, I guess, white cells count went like that. He's still alive to this day. Uh, it, it's just... My, my cousin Larry said it was amazing the, the impact, the, the effect it had on him that Patrick Waugh would, would, would call him and, and talk to him and whatever they talked about. And, and so that's the side of Patrick that, that, that I know, like my, the, the crazy, the, you know, like the stupidness that happened in Montreal and all that. <laughs> Excuse me. He, he was a competitor, but well, he was, he was a passionate, caring person too. And, and just, he loved he loved being around uh, people. Like he just, he just loved being around his teammates and and uh, the coaching staff. And uh, I can I can't thank him enough for doing what what he did for for, uh, for my for Sean, my 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 cousin's uh, uh, son. And you know, to to this day, I mean, that, we're going back. That's twenty plus years. It, it's and they had picked out his gravesite because this kid was not doing well. And uh, that, you know, <laughs> coincidence, or who knows, but I, I believe there's a correlation. Great story. Just yeah, yeah, phenomenal is. stuff. When you were with Colorado as a video coach and learning what a video coach means, <laughs> uh, I'm wondering how hard it was, Fixie, for you to maybe find negative clips of a guy like Joe Sackick or Peter Forsberg <laughs> or Ray Bork or Patrick Wall. <laughs> You know, um, <laughs> yeah, well, you, you, I, I was told to do like Mark, Mark Crawford was the boss and he said, you know, find this, find that, whatever. And, you know, prep this, prep that. I, and I spent an awful lot of time with, with Patrick, Patrick, and you know, I'm going back to like, now it's, it's all click, you know, click and click and, and everything's right there. Like we had VHS, so you'd have to rewind, you know, He'd want to see the goals between periods. And so you'd have to, I'd look at the counter and 
you'd have to rewind to whatever that number was and find it, you know, and then the tape stretches and all that stuff that you, you dealt with. Right. But Patrick would come in after every game and want to see his goals. And I'll never f- forget his son. I, I don't know if the goaltender was uh, Frederick or Jonathan. One of his sons was a goalie. And I, I believe it was Frederick and uh, Patrick's in there and he'd look and, you know, like my, I know this isn't on video, but my glove should have been here to cut the angle of the puck going there. Right. My glove was here and it went over the glove and his son, the one night he's saying, dad, dad, you need, you need to step out further. You need to get your chest out. You need to put your, his, his son who would have been, I don't know, eight, seven, eight was, was uh, critiquing Patrick. And I thought, God, this is, this is good, you know, but, but the, the players were really good. They, they wanted everybody wants positive clips mm-hmm. and you say negative it's it's not negative i always looked at it as, as teaching clips you know and 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 so you can say negative or whatever but it was teaching and they and the guys wanted that like claude lemieux was was one of the um, like he was in there for hours after a game it used to drive me nuts because i couldn't leave to go home till he left <laughs> but he he would break down every shift and i used to track i had a, a bank of the vcrs and uh, for for those people out there listening mike who have no idea what vcrs are you'll have to explain that but i had a bank of vcrs and i would have just one and i would you know hit hit record pause when say claude was on the ice just to get his shifts and you know uh, uh, record pause for the power plays and all those sorts of things and so it was pretty chaotic. Uh, I, and now it's, by the time I finished, we were using uh, laptops and, and, and computers and, 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 and I had evolved in that regard. But for the first number of years, we'd go on the road and I'd have a bag of VHS tapes of, you know, let's say we're going into play Minnesota, St. Louis and Chicago. I'd have VHS tapes of all those teams. And, and you know, like it was heavy. Like, I was you're just going to say, I'm thinking the weight around. of these things. No, yeah, you're carrying all that stuff around and, and, you know, like uh, VHS machines and like it was, you know, it, was, it wasn't easy. I, I like how you just automatically assumed I'm the one that has to explain a VCR because like Popers way too young. Eh? Fix is that. I get it. That was a little dig. OK, I see how it is. <laughs> one of the other players that that uh, Popper mentioned. And again, we, we think about these guys and, and we think about them as the athletes that they are and what we see on the ice. But I think what we might overlook and I'm thinking specifically here of Peter Forsberg is the culture shock of coming to North America to play the game. And, and I wonder if there were parallels between Forsberg when you got to know him in Colorado and, and Radic Faxa in Kitchener, not so much on the ice, but I remember you saying once that you tried to teach Radic Faxa a new word every day, because yep. here's the Czech kid in Kitchener, right? And, and I'm, I'm guessing that similar language barriers may have existed for the Swede. We all know he could play the language or he spoke the language of hockey, but I'm sure there's a bit of fish out of water time. I wasn't, I wasn't in Quebec when, when Peter, uh, you know, he was drafted by Philadelphia, right? Right. The, the trade to Quebec for Lindros and all that. So I wasn't there when this happened, but uh, you know, the hotel chain quality suites. So Peter, Peter goes, he's in Quebec city and he's new, he's young. He needs to get a suit and he sees, he sees a sign quality suites. So he thinks, okay, I'm going to go get myself a suit. He goes, he goes into quality suites looking for a suit. (laughs) No, I wasn't there, but that's, that's what, uh, you know, the story I heard from the guys, but uh, yeah. So language, language was a barrier. Our first year in, Colorado, I believe we had eight, we had, uh, you know, Czech, Russian, Swede, uh, Finn, uh, German, French, English. I think we had eight different languages. And I remember Mark Crawford, one of his first press conferences was uh, talking about how difficult will it be to communicate with all these different languages on your team. And he said, it's very simple. In hockey, there's, there's two languages. There's English, and vulgarity and they're very good at the latter you know <laughs> and so english english obviously was the, the the language that you know we coached in and players had to learn radic radic's english when when he got here i remember i picked him up at the airport like it, it was zero like it, he had no no english and i drove we were going to this uh, ice session up at rim park he was skating 
and we pull up and I he, like he's sitting in the passenger seat of my car and I said right like no like we get out now like we, we go into the ring like he had no no con like there was no communication uh, I remember dealing with Milan Hayduk. Remember Milan Hayduk? He was number 23 for us, a great player. And Bob Harley was the coach at that point. And I used to have to draw a 23 on like a, a, a grease board, a whiteboard, and like put arrows and kind of show 23 going this way and going that way and and then kind of relate that to video and stuff. And so there's a real learning curve. No question. Peter's English was was per, pretty good. Like it was much better than a lot of players. Um, like M Milan, when Milan came over from uh, back then, it was Czechoslovakia, but Czech Republic now, he uh, he, he had no English, like zero. And these guys, uh, Santa Zozlich, I don't know if you recall that name. Uh, very, very little, very minimal English. And they would watch uh, game shows like Price is Right and and game shows like that, uh, and uh, soap operas. And that's how these guys learned English, like soap operas and, and game shows. Learning English, those are the days of our lives. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, that was bad. Uh, as a Red Wing supporter, I've made it through the Colorado Avalanche talk. I'm glad I made it through that. That was difficult. Uh, <laughs> Fixie, yeah, I joke, but it is OHL stories. I'm curious about your time in Sudbury. How difficult was it to leave Kitchener? Uh, very, but it was an opportunity to be a head coach. Uh, ultimately, I, I went up there like uh, Trent Cole was still there when, mm -hmm. when I actually got the job, and I was going to be his uh, associate. And then, whatever happened, I I became the head coach. Uh, it, it was just an opportunity. You're always a, about opportunity, and and I, I I saw myself being a head coach up there eventually. I I I think the situation with Trent and the management wasn't great. I knew that. Um, and as I alluded to earlier, I'm a competitive guy. I want to, I, I want to you know, I wanted to be head coach and uh, it wasn't easy though to leave. Um, uh, I, I loved it here. Uh, I still love it. I still live here, obviously. And, uh, but the opportunity to maybe be head coach was there. Uh, my experience up there wasn't great. Mm -hmm. um uh I, I i i regret i don't know if regret's the right word but i i would i i would have liked to have had a better opportunity the, the first year we we were decent we made the playoffs we lost lost the north bay in, in the in the first round we had traded for rad Raddick actually joined joined us that year and i i thought we actually had a, a good team to to make a bit of a run uh, frankie palazies was with us and you know uh, we, we lost North Bay, which, which had a pretty good team and, and stands a heck of a coach, tough to coach against. Uh, then the next year went, went really bad. And, and, um, obviously I got fired in January and, uh, that was tough to take. Like getting fired isn't easy. It's, it's very humbling. Um, and you know, you, 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 you reflect a lot on, on, you know, what could I have done differently? What could I have done better to, to have more success? And then, you know, I only had one more, one more year after that in, in Rochester and, and it came to an end pretty quickly after that. And mm -hmm. I, I've been out of the game for a number of years now. Uh, and, and honestly, I, I miss it every day. Like I, I, I do. I, there's things that I, I, I truly miss. Uh, there's things I don't miss, but um, it, it, it ends fast. And, and um, so, yeah, it's, but it was tough. It was tough leaving here, Popper, to to go up there. But I saw it as a, a chance to maybe. And I remember my assistant was Dave Matzos, and we were standing, we were standing at center ice. Um, uh, the ice wasn't in yet. It was in the summer, and we were looking around the history of the team, and you know, like there's some great names up there: eh? Dugay, Felino, uh, Hunter, and goes on and on. Randy Carlisle. And him and I saying, how great will it be to win a Memorial Cup and have that wolf, like like that wolf emblem on the on the uh, on the on the ring. So that's you know we 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 had a vision that we never got to, but uh, it, it was fun. Working with Dave was 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 a tremendous experience. You meet new people all the way uh, all along, right? And and so uh, 
uh, you know, there's there's good memories from there's a lot of bad memories, unfortunately, but there's there's a lot of good memories for sure. One of the moments that that stands out, and I feel the guilt bringing it up, based on what we just talked about, but can't talk about your time as a head coach in Sudbury, and you know you got to answer all the questions. Yep. And I remember hopping on a bus after uh, wherever we were on the road, and something popped through my phone. Hey, you hear what happened with Fix up in the Sioux? So uh, I'll just put it this way, Fix. Are you and uh, Peter Rucci on speaking terms? Are you sending each other Christmas cards now? What's the deal? <laughs> oh, God. I, that's when I realized how, how impactful the media is and, and the world that we live in now. Like, that was a, Mike, that was a Wednesday night in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. Uh, and <laughs> Sault Ste. Marie to Sudbury is, you know, three hours away, let's say. And I get back to, uh, to Sudbury and my niece who's living in San Diego texts me and says, Uncle Paul, I just saw you on ESPN. That was awesome. So TSN, <laughs> I guess TSN had picked it up and you know TSN and ESPN and blah, 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 and all that stuff, right? So uh, Mike, you know, there's a bit of a background to that story and I, I, don't, I don't know how much I should say or but P Peter had written a story about uh, a player on our team, Connor Burgess, whose father owned the team, who, you know, was my boss. And I, I didn't like what he had written. Uh, I, I thought it was very uh, offside about a 17 year old player. And I was defending that player as I would defend any player, but especially that player. And Peter could have asked me any question that he wanted to that night. And I probably would have had, the same response to any question regarding the game. We had lost that game to, to Sheldon. <laughs> Sheldon was coaching in the Sioux at the time. Uh, we had lost, you know, we had, we had a, we had a good rivalry with the Sioux. We had, we beat them and they beat us. So that that's what a rivalry is when you're beating one another and they beat us that night. So I wasn't in a good mood. And, and Peter, Peter was the first question. And, and I, you know, I said, I do regret it to, to this day. I, I wish, you know, I, I think I'm a better person person than that I'm a bigger person than that I shouldn't have said what I said uh, but I'm passionate and I care and, and I was defending a player and that's why I said it but to this day my mother reminds me that I wasn't raised that way and I wasn't raised to speak that in that manner to anybody so uh, I'm still reminded of it every, on a daily basis when I walk six houses down, uh, down the road six houses and see my parents my mother reminds me um, you know it's it, it, I guess it's one of those things, you, you know, you, you kind of laugh at it now because I get so many calls with buddies that are traveling or whatever. And they're in an airport and they see the TSN top 10 coaches gone mad or, you know, top 10 things you shouldn't say on TV, blah, blah, blah. And sure enough, I'm there every, every time. So I guess I'll just have to live with it. That's a good story because I'm always bugging my mother now. I'm 36 and I always bug her. Can you just stop mothering me? Like, I'm fine. I'm going to make my own decision. She's like, mother never stops being your mother. So you're it, still getting it. It doesn't end. <laughs> it doesn't end. Why? You know, I had a lot of people reach out to me and, and, and uh, you know, support me, whatever. My mother, Paul, you weren't raised that way. You weren't raised that, that way to, to speak in that manner or to speak to people in that manner. So I'm reminded of it still to this day, Popper. <laughs> I love it. I love that. Uh, go ahead, Farzi. Uh, it would also be impossible to talk about your junior career and the time you spent with Steve Spot to imagine that you were never on the receiving end of one of his infamous practical jokes. He must have got you at least once. <laughs> oh, yeah. Spotter <laughs> did. Like, he'd, uh, <laughs> he was a good practical joker. He was. Yeah. is probably to this day yeah. yeah and he he would send like he'd, he'd get my phone you know i never had a password on my phone like i like i, I can't remember my password right so he, he'd get the phone and you know all of a sudden my wife's calling me hey what's up like i i heard what are you talking about you know spotter had sent a message that you know i had got hurt at practice or whatever and in, in, in the hospital it, it, it was endless just like the, the, the he was just he was, you know, that typical class clown who just, it never, but Mike, I will say he didn't like it in return. You know, you just, you do something on him. He didn't really like that. So we had fun. He, uh, 
he he showed me uh he taught me that uh you know there is a, a lighter like you, you can let your let your guard down a little bit you know you have some fun and and he, he was about that we had a good staff uh when i when i look back at like like barry hoke and, and danny liebold and and troy myself and 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 uh, steve it, it was a good staff we had a lot of fun the travels you know you were there with with don and like the travels together um when you're when you're spending that much time boy you better you better get along or it's a hell of a long year and 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 we did we we worked hard and and we did our best and and we had a lot of fun along the way and that's really what it's about and we tried to impact that uh, have that impact on the kids too like it's yeah you know it's it, interesting I, I i saw you you know monday mike at the university of waterloo uh, golf fundraiser for for the athletics program and ran into chase campbell and jacob Cas cascanet amongst other athletes you know i mean those are two hockey players but uh every every hole had a had an athlete from the university program and talking to them and and but but the, the two hockey players said paul like the, it, we just love playing university hockey and i used to say that to the guys like you know, everybody has this this vision of, of going on to being on TV and, and making making the big dollars and stuff, but that only happens for so many. And these two guys are having the time of their lives playing university hockey, and I was so so happy to hear that because that used to be my message to the guys: like pursue it, but boy, have Plan B in place. And Plan Plan, plan B is pretty good. Playing university hockey in Canada is tremendous. It's great hockey. Uh, you get an education, and and in the end. You walk out of there going, wow, that was fun. And that's what it should be all about. It was really nice to, to kind of reconnect with, uh, with Chase and Jacob and, and talk to other young athletes who are just having the time of their life. And the fact that they're back competing, they were so thrilled because, you know, they've lost two years to not compete. Do you have a, I know you spent some time with Torch. Do you have a good Torch story? <laughs> <laughs> My favorite torch story, and if he's listening, Mike, I apologize. He was he was playing. Mike Mike was a Mike was a heck of a goalie, as you know, and and a good goalie coach. Like he 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 cared. I I cut I cut all his video for him, and so I saw what he was doing. But uh, Kenny Hitchcock, I, I ran into him, you know, when I was in the National League, and talked about talked about Mike Torch because he had coached him in Kalamazoo in the International Hockey League. And he said, and Mike's, Mike's a bigger guy. <laughs> and uh, he said, uh, you know, he was a, he was a great athlete. The only thing that really kept that guy out of the NHL was a knife and fork. <laughs> Storch, if you're listening, I've apologized, but oh, I had to tell that story. Mike, Mike was a good goalie though. You know, you, 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 you he had great success in junior and played, played pro hockey. Not a lot of us can say that we've done that. So kudos to him. Uh we're getting on time. We got to let you go fix, even though I think this could go on. Like I, I, and you know, you mentioned being on those road trips and, and getting along with the staff. And I always valued those times that we would get to over coffee in the morning, over after breakfast or whatever, just to talk about the game, talk about life a little bit. It, it was, it was great for me. So just from me to you on that, on that score, I always did enjoy it. But well, before, and it, I yeah. remember like, like, like spotter used to always say to you and Don guys, we're having a video meeting, hang around. And, and and you guys you guys would like we we'd have we'd have video meetings with the players and you guys would be there and then that would give you you know intel insight into the team so i you know so that we were close we were close in that group sorry to cut you off no not at all i, I i'm glad you brought that part of it up too you should hear the stuff he says when we're not on camera fix <laughs> don't buy into this <laughs> uh pope's gonna have one more he always has one last question but i want to know and and you talked about obviously with Colorado being back for the first time in 21 years and sending a text over to the team. Uh, where are your rings? <laughs> they're, they're uh, in the house. I, I gave, uh, I gave my dad the, the, the 96 ring. I wore it for a year or a little bit, <laughs> gave it to my dad. He wore it for years and uh, you know, he'd go to the coffee shop, be with his buddies, whatever. And, and, and he loved wearing that ring. Dad's getting up in years now. He doesn't get out of the house much. He's 96. Uh, so I, I have that ring back in my, my possession. Uh, the 2001 ring I've, I've always had. I don't wear them much, Mike, uh, but I was traveling recently to, uh, I went out to Calgary 
to play in a, a pro-am uh, event with my wife. She does for Alzheimer's. And I always take my rings with me just because somebody might want to see them. And on my, my flight out and my flight back, both the people I'm sitting beside, you get talking and you get talking hockey and, I, and you know, they love hockey. And I brought the rings out to show them. And that's where I get the most the most enjoyment is showing people the rings and, and, you know, then they want to take pictures and stuff. They're almost too big to wear. Um, I, the, the thing that I love most about winning the cup is my name will be in the hall of fame forever on, on the Stanley cup. And that to me is, is the greatest thing. Take the rings, take the, you know, the, the money that we got, the bonuses that's long spent. My, <laughs> my, my name, my name will always be on the cup. And, and that to me is, is the greatest thing. I, years ago, I took my, I, I don't have children. My wife and I don't have children, but I took my father and my nephew there. So kind of three generations and to see, to see your name and point it to your dad and, and point it to your nephew, that that's really special. And um, I never thought that I would be a Stanley cup winner. Like I wasn't good enough as a player. I just was fortunate enough as a coach to, to get the opportunity. Real and quick. good enough with VHS. That that too. Play, pause, play, pause, play. <laughs> you you mentioned uh, you mentioned your dad a few times. Just real quick, uh, how's his lawn? <laughs> it's it's the best. It's the best in the uh, street. It's perfect. That's no. what I thought you'd say. Yeah. Yeah. D- dad, dad, and mom are doing well. They're ninety two and ninety six. My my I guess my my job or not jobs not the right word, but my focus in life right now is to make to make their lives as best it can be and. And they're in their house and doing well. And I take, I take care of them, my wife and I. And that's uh, as much fun as I had coaching. Uh, this is way better, taking care of mom and dad. And at the end of the day, going down and having a nice happy hour with dad is pretty special. I don't even want to ask another question. That's just like, <laughs> come on. That's perfect. That's awesome to hear, Fixie. Um, I do have just a quick question. And it's kind of on the same lines is Mike I'm sure and I'm just speaking for you here but I'm sure you are cheering for Colorado and Gabriel Landeskog in this upcoming Stanley Cup final we asked about the rings but behind you I can see a mini Stanley Cup and I'm wondering if we can see it (laughs) I'm not sure you're going to want to see that one (laughs) (laughs) that's allowed that's that's my wife does a lot of events with the NHL uh uh, alumni so that's the uh, 89 uh uh, Calgary Flames. Okay. Uh, so I'm in, I'm in her office right now. I, I don't have an office in this house. I'm, <laughs> I'm a cellar dweller. So that's her, her, her passion, but, but it's signed by uh, Lanny McDonald and, uh, uh, Oh God, Harry bears, or not Barry bears and, uh, Colin Patterson and different guys cool. from the, from the 89 team. And that's, that's her. She's a flames fan. She wasn't too happy when, when they, when they lost out, uh, I am cheering for the abs. I, I, I think it's going to be uh, abs and Rangers. I, I know the lightning look good right now. Um, and you know, you're the champ until you're dethroned, but I, I think the Rangers are the team and I think that would be a great series. Uh, and I'd love it. I'm, I'm abs all the way. Always have been, you know, always will be. I, how, how can't you uh, cheer for the team that employed you for 12 years? <laughs> loyalty it can be bought apparently right it can be bought yeah, it just cost you two rings <laughs> exactly uh fix so much fun always enjoyed our chats like i said whether they be about hockey or about life this is great to get you on the podcast to hear some of these stories and thanks a ton for making the time for us thanks guys uh thanks for having me i love to talk i love to tell stories um and uh, i just appreciate the opportunity